You're listening to The Savings Tip Jar with Dom Beattie and Harrison Asprey, powered by savings.com.au, your home of consumer finance news, guides and product comparisons. G'day, welcome to another episode of The Savings Tip Jar podcast, recorded on RBA Day Eve, with some expecting rates to be held steady for the first time in a year. I'm Dom Beatty, and joining me, as always, to discuss that and all the other hot topics in Oz Finance is Harrison Asprey. Harrison. Thanks. Thanks, Dom. Uh, Wowza. So the first time in a year, when you put it like that, of potentially no rate rise, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. But yeah, uh, you talk about RBA Eve, I'm talking about uh, Phil Lowe Eve. So Phil Lowe's, uh, he's delivering a nice little Christmas present, potentially. Uh, and I'll leave out a glass of milk and a cookie for him. Um, hope to entice him on the podcast one day and we can crack some myths around Phil Lowe and RBA. Um, but look, yeah, uh, we've got a good episode coming up. So uh, later on, uh, we have uh, Eliza Owen. Uh, she's the head of research there at Core Logic, uh, which is a property research firm. So it'll be good to chat to her about all things property and you know what's moving the markets and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, yeah, Dom, great episode. Yeah, it should be a good one. But um, yeah, I'm sure you guys might have noticed if you listened to previous episodes that Harrison does have a strange fascination with Phil Lowe, the RBA governor's um, day-to-day habits outside of RBA stuff. You know what he's eating. What it was, you know what he'd be like as Father Christmas. Is that alluded to in that metaphor there. Um, where he swims, where he plays golf. I mean, you 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 quoted an article in the Daily Mail, weren't you? Yeah. Well, that's that wasn't my fault. That wasn't my obsession. Everyone's obsessed with him at the moment. He's the uh, the nation's hottest celebrity. Yeah. Um, I was quoted in a Daily Mail article. Uh, over the weekend and sandwiched between my two quotes was a photo of Phil Lowe playing golf. So the man can't even play, you know, nine or 18 holes and then have uh, a nice 19 hole, 19th hole beer afterwards, yep. you know, without getting papped. Um, you know, there's like, I don't know what the Hemsworths are doing nowadays, but uh, Phil Lowe seems like the hottest celebrity. Yeah, paparazzi is following him everywhere, it seems. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that brings us to to the news. The top news topic for this week has yeah. Let's talk about the big pale elephant in the room, uh, RBA. So Dr. Phil Lowe. Um, there's a lot of conjecture around if they will they won't they around the cash rate rise on Tuesday. So the RBA meets uh, the first Tuesday of every month, um, and there's a lot of talk uh, from economists and just the market in general and the whole media sphere around a uh, potential talk of a um, of a cash rate pause, which would be the first in uh, yeah nearly a year, uh, like you said. So the cash rate is now 3.6%. Um, a hike would take it to 3.85. But yeah, a lot of people are saying, Dom, that uh, there's potentially a pause and that's due to some sort of softer economic data that's come out. Yeah, well, if you, I mean, if you're listening to this a bit later, um, you know, a lot of this discussion will be redundant um, but uh, no, it certainly would be interesting if they held rates steady. Um, it does seem like you know the general financial markets are expecting um, you know rates to be held. I think it's about ninety percent is it? what they're saying. Uh, whereas economists um, are actually putting it at you know probably more fifty fifty. If you just look at the big four uh, banks, they're in house economists. Um, it's ANZ and um, NAB both yeah. think there'll be another twenty five basis point rate hike. Uh, whereas Westpac and, and Combank think um, rates will be held steady. But um, yeah, we'll see. I guess no doubt uh, if rates are held steady, uh, a lot of uh, mortgage holders will be very relieved to hear that. Um, but uh, potentially, you know, there'll be some people who are you know, earning lots of interest in their savings accounts, such yeah. as uh, debt free pensioners or uh, debt free um, you know, young savers. They'll You're be truly. maybe a bit, bit disappointed, you know, hoping to see rates keep going up and up and up. Yeah, well, like for the first time in a while, um, we've seen uh, savings account rates uh, at like a ten-year high. I think I think they are right now, um, and yeah, five like the top savings accounts are around five percent right mm-hmm. now, um, with inflation at a headline rate of seven point eight and going down. You know, the, uh, the the gulf is starting to narrow a little bit. It seems like so savers are getting a better return on their money than before, and you know, just when it seems to be getting better and better. Um, there could be the uh, cash rate pause. Um, but yeah, for mortgage holders, uh, they've uh, faced a lot of um, hardship over the last sort of year or so with uh, mortgage rates just keep, keeping on going up. And um, I think CBA's uh, economist there, Gareth Ed, he's actually said that more than half of the rate rises so far haven't actually affected anyone. 
in terms of like forcing them to reduce their spending or seeing their repayments increase and things like that because a lot of people still are on fixed rates yeah. by the way are starting to roll off around now yeah um so there's a lot more to come so even if the rba pauses in april uh, that doesn't mean that so the pain stops unfortunately yeah what would you say there's cause for a pause Aaron? cause for a pause and applause for phil Lowe for okay. being brave in the face of scrutiny okay yeah yeah i mean we saw with inflation uh monthly inflation data seemed to be softening a fair bit the retail trade data was quite weak it was still growing but very little it was like point two percent i think so i think that's those are the main things the rba will be thinking about but um uh, on to other news uh in the rental markets um it's been interesting to see uh queensland talking about putting in a rental cap in place which has freaked a lot of people out particularly those sort of landlord groups and, and property groups who freak out by the prospect of government intervention in the markets mm-hmm. but um seems like uh queensland hasn't gone as, as hard as some people feared and ha- have do seem to be talking just about a um a restriction on rental hikes being restricted to just one rental increase per year as opposed to, to two per year. Mm. So, bit of a compromise, Harrison? Yeah, I, I feel like this might have been a bit of a more softball approach by the Queensland government because if we look to another uh, state or um, territory, the, the ACT, they have rent caps there too. Um, and the rent cap, I think we mentioned this in the last episode, Dom, um, the, rent, the rents are capped down there uh, 10 percentage points above the inflation rate per year so with the inflation theoretically at 7.8 percent the annual rental price increase is capped at 17.8 percent um and that seems like a pretty mathematical approach to um to that sort of problem there um so queensland's one could be a bit of a compromise and look who can blame them because there's been a lot of critique uh, from property groups the reiq and things like uh, and groups like like the reiq um, they've all said, you know, this won't really solve anything. You know, punishing investors is just going to drive investors out of the market further. And um, this is a, a problem of supply. You know, um, mm. supply has been constrained over the last sort of 10 years. Um, and to be honest, like Brisbane enjoyed pretty low rents, especially in inner Brisbane for a while. And this could just be a case of just the market catching up to uh, a lot of supply, um, like too much supply. Well, yeah, yeah, that was the the hot topic just a few years ago. I can yeah. remember that where they were talking about a supply glut. Mm. Um, there was just a huge tsunami of apartments hitting the market, um, particularly you know in areas those kind of inner city areas, Bowen Hills, yep. West End. There were just new there were cranes as far as the eye could see. So people were thinking, oh, it's going to be a huge dip in, um, you know, not just rents but also property, just general property prices. People mm. were thinking, oh, why am I going to why why buy a house out and um, Slacks Creek, when I can get a, like a really cool inner city apartment um, for about the same price in, in West End or or the Valley or, or Bowen Hills. So yeah, yeah it's uh, interesting how the quickly the, the tables turn, and now yeah. we're talking about huge um, restrictions of supply. I mean, we've got there's much has been said about um, the immigration ramping up, right? Mm. Um, hundreds of thousands of, of new migrants coming into the country. I don't know how many people are actually leaving the country as well. Yeah. So that sort of counteracts it a bit. But I, I dare say it's, it's it's not not as many people leaving as there are coming in. So posing a real problem, particularly for the rental markets, because when people first land in the country, they're not really often in a position to buy. They need somewhere to rent temporarily. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe this is, you know, just a, a, a short-term um uh, yeah, solution. But um, obviously, the long-term solution is supply, supply, supply. supply yeah, need to boost um, yeah supply throughout Australia really for for housing. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's uh, talk about the sort of home loan side of things now. So um, last week, ING uh, cut a fair few longer-term fixed-rate home loans uh, by up to twenty-five basis points. So by longer term, I mean three, four, and five-year rates. Um, and uh, to my calculation, uh, ING is one of the most competitive lenders in that space. So if you're looking to uh, get a three or four or five year fixed rate home loan, uh, ING will often be at the top of you know comparison rate tables and things like that um, in terms of the interest rate. So, um, and to my knowledge as well, I think there's been around 10 other lenders that have cut similar fixed rates recently. So. Dom, is this a sign of things to come? You know, banks often move fixed rates uh, in the lead up to maybe um, some some RBA movement or things like that, and it could be a good indication of where the market is heading. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely a key sign that uh, interest rate cuts may be on their way mm. when the lenders start cutting their uh, fixed rate home loans because you know obviously they're they're full of you know ex financial experts that mm. can somehow see into the future and um, generally know uh, where the market is heading. Um, also, though, you know a lot of uh, lenders in Australia um, get a lot of their funding from overseas markets, so. You know, the kind of old school way of sourcing funding as a bank was to, you know, obviously offer savings accounts and turn deposits and people put their money in the bank, think it's a safe place to, to store it, earn some interest. Um, meanwhile, the bank is actually using that money to, to lend it out to people and, and earn um, interest yeah. on that themselves. Um, so, uh, yeah, but uh, a lot of them these days actually get a lot of their funding as I said, from these overseas markets like bonds and, and the like. And I think at the moment, a lot of bond yields are, are going down. So it means that a lot of their funding costs for, for new loans are actually dropping a fair bit. And obviously a lot of lenders, are, it's a very competitive marketplace in Australia. A lot of people competing for, for people's, um, um, for, for customers to, to lend out to. So uh, ING, this seems like they're, they're trying to get their head Get, get ahead of the game, um, particularly with fixed rates. Now, fixed rates, you're really locking in a customer for a long time. Yeah. So that's why they're trying to be people. Yeah, it's particularly, particularly competitive here. So, uh, you know, with expectations that um, interest, interest rates could be cut a fair bit in the future, probably want these lenders are probably wanting to lock people in at, you know, a higher rate than, you know, it might look like a pretty good rate now, but it might actually be a fair bit higher than, than what people are paying on variable rates. Um, mm. You know, a few you know a, a year from now so yeah well we'll see how this all plays out but, but definitely it's a, it's a sign that we, we could be looking at some rate cuts later in the year as as some such as you know westpac's bill evans the, yep. the profits of australian economics as some people see yeah. it uh he's expecting you know six to seven rate cuts over the next uh, couple of days so yeah we'll see how that plays out um and finally in uh, some other news uh we're seeing some data coming out showing that 90 percent of australian suburbs are now cheaper to rent than buy which you know might not come as a surprise to you. I mean, we've always expected it to be generally quite cheap to rent. You know, when we talk about renting versus buying in terms of costs, yeah, we're talking about those. You know, your weekly rent compared to what the weekly equivalent mortgage repayment yep. would be. Um, and usually, um, mortgage mortgages are much higher. Uh, the mortgage repayments are much higher than than the rent costs. But when we saw just a you know about a year ago when interest rates were at record lows, mm. uh, it often was quite, you know, in some suburbs, you know, cheaper suburbs, um, but nonetheless, uh, it was often quite cheaper to, to buy than rent. So your mortgage repayments, your weekly mortgage repayments were, <laughs> yeah, it, you might as well have bought the place because those would have been lower than uh, than the rent. Yeah. So, yeah, it seems to be returning back the other way now um, mm. with interest rates being so much higher if you're paying five six seven percent on your mortgage yeah chances are your your weekly mortgage repayments um will be much yeah. higher than, than what it would cost to rent and yeah look there's a few sort of market factors going on here um so i guess uh for those sort of beachside uh like destination suburbs it'll still be um a lot more expensive you'd think to rent than to actually buy there but who knows um and then in a lot of sort of luxury blue chip suburbs such as four clues and rose bay and uh, sydney's upper crust sort of suburb areas um it's cheaper to rent because you know <laughs> no one really wants to spend you know 10 grand a week to rent mm -hmm. when they can just buy it and then at the same time too if the property is you know five million dollars that's a hefty mortgage payment at you know six or seven percent so um but look, everyone's doing it tough. Renters are doing it tough with their rent increases. Mortgage holders are doing it tough. They, um, it doesn't mean that suddenly, you know, renting is a good deal or anything. It just means that, uh, you know, mortgage payments have probably gone up further than rent hikes have because, you know, leases are often signed for six months or a year and um, rent doesn't go up in those times. So there's a bit of a lag effect there too. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, but yeah, property, it's, it's something we, we always want to talk about. So brings us to our fiscal focus for this episode um, featuring Eliza Owen from CoreLogic. Whether you're a homeowner or a renter, residential property is a prime factor in the financial equation of Aussie households, which is why it's never far from the topic of conversation around dinner tables, barbecues and boardrooms throughout the nation. And especially now, with the current state of the market, it really feels like property is dominating our day-to-day -day discussions. 
We really can't seem to talk enough about property, so let's talk some more about it with CoreLogic Australia's Head of Research, Eliza Owen. Eliza, welcome to the Savings Tip Chart Podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Eliza, first question off the rank. Uh, despite further interest rate rises, uh, property prices appear to be lifting again in many parts of the country. What's going on here? Yeah, it's a bit of a surprise turn once again in our housing market. But basically, we started to see CoreLogic's daily home value index increase through the month of March. And our end of month report, which um, has just come out today, is showing a 0.6% rise. So that's been led by the four largest capital cities, in particular Sydney, where values increased 1.4%. We put this down to relatively low levels of stock, both in Sydney, but also nationally. Uh, Across the combined capital cities, there's about 84,000 properties that we've counted advertised for sale in the past month, but usually your listings volumes would be closer to 100,000 this time of year. So that is potentially creating some more competition amid relatively low levels of stock. On top of that, you've got a couple of other factors which are providing a kind of tailwind for capital growth right now. That includes a strong bounce back in overseas migration to the point where we actually saw a record volume of net overseas migration to Australia in the September quarter of last year, albeit that's pretty lagged data. But even overseas arrivals data since has shown that strong return of tourists, longer term migrants, um, overseas students. So we think that with the rental market in particular um, becoming even tighter with the return of overseas migrants, that could be pivoting some decisions to maybe the purchasing market as well. Um, And I, I think potentially just that rental market environment could be maybe attracting more investors in some parts of the country, even though broadly it's still much more expensive to service a mortgage relative to rental income. So a few tailwinds there. Um, and and again, you, you sort of noted as well, Harrison, the potential for further interest rate rises. We're not completely out of the woods just yet. There are some further headwinds that could be presented for the market this year. Um, but so far, the trend is definitely looking more positive. So Eliza, um, you, you mentioned uh, sort of uh, low listings at the moment. Can you explain why the, there is a, a sheer lack of listings? Um, and, and do you think that there'll be an increase in listings soon when uh, you know the heat is turned up with uh, interest rate rises? Yeah, good question. So at the moment, we think that listings are low because people are opting to not sell their property. Uh, people get turned off selling when property prices are going down. And as it is, we've just been through a record peak to trough decline in national home values of 9% from April last year. Um, interestingly, prior to that, total listings volumes were pretty low as well, but that was because of a really strong selling environment. So for every new property that was being added, more than one was selling. It was it was that strong a market. Now you've got this much softer market where people have held their properties back in a way that's kind of good news from a financial stability perspective because it means that people aren't forced to sell. Um, And that is reinforced by a very tight labour market at the moment. We've seen the unemployment rate at these generational lows of 3.5%. So there is a risk that as mortgage rates not only continue to rise, but you have a large stock of fixed loans, about 880000 this year is the estimate, that will be repriced at a much higher variable rate over the course of 2023. That could cause some people to reconsider whether they can actually hold on to their property at such high interest rates and might see more stock added to the market. But we don't see it as this kind of flood of distressed properties. We see it as more a very small pool of marginal mortgage holders on low incomes who are maybe overstretched with their borrowing uh, are going to be the ones who might have to make those tough decisions. For sure. Um, And you kind of touched on it there as well. Uh, But there's been a lot of talk about the kind of uh, refinancing cliff or the fixed rate mortgage cliff with all the code. Uh, home loans that were written um, a few years ago starting to roll off um, and you kind of mentioned that it won't really be like a whole flood um, but will, like will there sort of be an apex because there's a lot of sort of young home buyers I guess that might be watching the news and thinking oh 
and and licking the lips saying, oh, I might be able to get a fire sale on the property that I've been eyeing off. But, you know, a- anecdotally, I'm attending auctions and open homes and there's still a lot of interest there. And as you said before, um, there's a lot of people who are just withdrawing their homes from the market or opting not to sell until maybe they have to. So um, can you explain that a bit more? If, like, will there be an apex of, um, of all the right buying conditions coming together at once or will it sort of just amount to um, a, a trickle, if you will? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think if there is an apex, this is the year because the RBA has estimated that about 560,000 uh, fixed loan terms were repriced in 2022. 2023 goes up to 880,000 and then 2024, the volume is is less again. So this is going to be the peak in terms of volume for fixed rate loans that, that transition. And that's because, um, you know, two years ago, you were looking at these record lows in um, three-year fixed rates of sub 2%. So with those expiries coming up, the question is, can the borrowers actually cope with a sharp rate rise from sub 2% to a variable rate environment of 5 to 6% or potentially more by the time we get to the end of the rate um, hiking cycle? So for a bit of understanding about this, we look to the variable rate environment where borrowers have already been subject to a large increase in interest rates and broadly they've been coping okay. Um, You know, we haven't seen a substantial rise in uh, loans past due. They're sitting at about 1% of mortgages uh, with the major bank, uh, with ADIs, with official banks in the December quarter. Um, So that's also a bit lagged, but the data we have so far combined with low listings volumes suggests that people are still able to service their mortgages and hold their property off the market. So the question is, are those fixed rate borrowers different to variable rate mortgage holders? Uh, The RBA suggests no, they're not. They have similar incomes, they have similar savings. And a recent bulletin put out by the RBA a couple of weeks ago showed that um, once all those fixed loans are repriced, there's only going to be a relatively small portion of loan holders that will be requiring more than 50% of their income to service their housing costs. And even then, you know, some people can quite comfortably use 50% of their income to service their mortgage costs. You only really look at the 30% of income as a stress point for low income households. So yes, there is more risk, but we see it as relatively contained to a small cohort. As you say, they're probably going to be more likely first home buyers and people on relatively low incomes. Um, and it's not great. It, like It's a horrible situation that some households are finding themselves in. But it is one that we imagine will be relatively contained and, and not spread across the broader market. That's like classic Aussie resilience, you know, droughts, floods, bushfires and rising interest rates. And we're <laughs> getting through it all. Um, on a different note, Eliza, uh, this is a bit of a two-part question. Um, you recently reported about the gender gap in the home ownership, and I wondered if this gender gap could be even wider than the figures demonstrate, given that you know, we know that some men put the property solely in their wife's name as a form of asset protection, for example, because their occupation or business interests may put them at high risk of being sued or declared bankrupt. So firstly, is this a factor? And secondly, what's driving this gender gap in home ownership? Yeah, it could well be a factor. Um, the way that we conduct the analysis is looking at the um, first name and taking that uh, or comparing that first name data to a gender API service. So you're assigning male or female, depending on the first name associated um, with ownership of the property. So that's always going to be limited. Uh, having said that, the majority of cases would uh, probably reflect a, a true ownership. And consistently, that data has shown that men tend to have a higher rate of property ownership than women of of the properties that we analyze. Uh, In terms of what causes the gap, there's probably a bit of a legacy issue, right, of historically women having relatively low levels of asset ownership, um, uh, labor force participation, um, and, and that... Um, being reflected in the property market today could be, you know, reflecting purchases from from decades ago. 
Um, so the idea is that as we th- see things like more gender pay parity, greater female labor force participation, which have actually been um, functions of the, the very tight labor market environment that we see at the moment, women might be more empowered when it comes to things like accumulating a 20% deposit. We also see the introduction of government schemes, um, particularly the help to buy scheme, ho- um, shared equity schemes like we saw introduced under the Parité um, government as well, that are really um, beneficial to women and, and single parent households in particular because they are targeting lower incomes. They are targeting people in um, sectors dominated by women uh, and they're helping people buy a home who without these policies probably wouldn't have been able to do so. So our expectation is that that gap will narrow and narrow over time. For sure. It's a interesting time to be a homeowner with a gender neutral name such as Ashley because you don't know if it'll be considered male or female. Um, anyway, yeah, we'll move uh, on slightly now to uh, the rental market. Um, so we, we've seen, you know, uh, mortgage payments increase pretty drastically, of course, but rental prices have also increased. Um, so what exactly has caused this? Is it a supply demand issue? Um, and will we see vacancy rates uh, rise to a more healthy level again soon? Because right now, a lot of uh, crit- uh, critics have described it as unsustainable, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, it, is it a, a supply demand issue? Yeah, it is a supply demand issue, and it's been caused by a lot of unique factors through the pandemic period. So the rental market upswing started from September 2020, and that was a time where we had these closed international borders and lockdowns and the fear of um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, But even without new demand for rental housing from overseas migrants, we saw domestically tenants wanting more space, fewer housemates, um, maybe a space to work from home. And that led to a decline in the number of households that were share housing and a simultaneous uplift in um, people moving in with their partner. So share houses breaking up, people, um, partners moving in together. Um, And the number of people per household as a result fell from about 2.6 to 2.5, which doesn't sound like that much of a difference. But the RBA estimates that it added to housing demand by about 120,000 dwellings. Wow. And remember, that's during the height of COVID at a time where, you know, you're not getting as much investor interest or initially there wasn't as much of investor interest, but there was a bit of an investment spike towards the end of um, 2021. Um, But also in that housing boom of 2021, you were at a point in time where the cash rate was sitting at this record low of 0.1%. And I think a lot of investors knew that the cash rate could only really go one way from there. So a lot of them sold off in the spring selling season of 2021. And if you're selling off rentals and they're going to owner occupiers, again, that's kind of taking away rental stock. So that's the kind of second major factor that that tightened up the rental market. Then you get to the start of 2022 and Australia opens up its international borders and we start to see the return of overseas migrants and tourists and, you know, short-term, long-term um, uh, migrants and, and uh, arrivals to Australia. Now, about 80% of overseas arrivals when they first get here are renters. So on top of that already tight labor, um, tight rental market that you had through to the end of 2021, you're now adding hundreds of thousands of people um, who are mostly wanting to rent as well. And that's where you've seen more recently, the most immense pressure is in the high density markets of Sydney and Melbourne, which is where most overseas migrants come as well. And that's where you get your TikToks of hundreds of people lined outside a property in the Eastern suburbs and um, Sydney unit rents up 18% in the year to March. Uh, so it, it's this kind of perfect storm. And I think it just goes to show that we really need a shake up in the way that we provide rental housing in Australia, because as long as mortgage rates continue to rise, the individual sort of mum and dad investor proposition isn't really stacking up and it's not helping to alleviate the rental crisis we have at the moment. For sure. Um, and and do you think that uh, policies, uh, like you might not be able to comment politically, but policies such as 
uh, Queensland's new rental cap to one per year. Like, do you think investors are looking at this going, I'll sell my property and reduce the pool of supply further? Or or do you think that's a lot of um, a lot of noise to, mo- to not much actual real effect in the real world? Yeah, look, I don't, I don't know that it helps. I think policies like rental caps are definitely coming from the right place in terms of trying to protect vulnerable households. Um, but it's probably something that does create a little more um, insecurity for, or insecurity is not the right right word, uncertainty for investors. So it certainly doesn't help. What I would say though is that investor participation is much more aligned with capital growth than it is with rental return or um, policies around rental security and mm. you know even reforms that we've seen to tenancy acts in in New South Wales or changes to um, depreciation um, claims on on investment properties. Those things have been happening for a long time, and and they're not the factors I would say that have really shifted the rental market in the past few years. So, you know, it, it doesn't help, but I don't think it's something that's necessarily going to um, completely disincentivize investors, especially in areas like Southeast Queensland, where there's still strong capital gains prospects. It's certainly a tough time to, to be a renter at the moment, um, obviously with this uh, rental crisis and uh, yeah, this supply issue. So hopefully it's um, rectified soon. But uh Eliza, really appreciate your insights on the uh, Savings Tip Jar podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Eliza. All right, Az, I think that uh, just about wraps it up for uh, another episode of the Savings Tip Jar. Yeah, exactly, Dom. Uh, what episode are we at now? That's 14 or 15 in the bank now. And um, yeah. again, yeah, oh, just too many is flowing off the books there. Uh, you know, the case file didn't start hitting its straps till about episode 100, so... You know, we, we've still got, you know, 85 more. Um, and, yeah, special uh, shout-out to Eliza again for um, sharing her yeah. time. Uh, especially, it's a pretty busy time to be a sort of research analyst and mm. um, and those sort of professions because they're all, all busy crunching the numbers, and yeah. uh, especially in the lead-up to um, RBA Day as well. So yeah. thanks to Eliza there. And thanks so so much again to all our listeners as well. Uh, always appreciate your support. Um, and as always, really appreciate any thoughts or feedback that you might have. Um, so please don't hesitate to get in touch via Savings Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or shoot an email to inquiries at savings.com.au, or ask a question. If you want us to read out your question um, on the podcast, uh, we'd, we'd be more than happy to and, yeah. and discuss that. So Ask on where he lives. Yeah, just just shoot an email off to us, and uh, we'll be sure to, to get back to you. All right, thanks, Az. Cheers. Thanks, Dom. Bye. Bye.